Now the first transducer mechanism is G protein coupled receptors also known as GPCRs. Now GPCRs these are cell membrane receptors which are linked to the effector. Effector can be any ion channel, any carrier protein or enzymes and these are known as G protein coupled receptors because they are coupled with GTP activated proteins that is guanosyl triphosphate activated proteins. As far as the structure, uh, structural organization is concerned, they, there are seven alpha helical membrane spanning units. These are the amino acid segments and there are seven of them which are alpha helical segments. And on the cytosolic side, they are coupled with G protein units, whereas on the extracellular side, there is a agonist binding site. Now the G proteins which are on the cytosolic side, they are heterotrimeric in nature. In heterotrimeric in composition, that means there are three subunits that is alpha, beta and gamma and in the inactive state they will be attached to GDP. Now what will happen when an agonist will come and bind to the receptor? When an agonist binds to the receptor now these proteins they are activated by GTP. Now GTP will come and knock out GDP and replace GDP uh, in, in this unit. After that on GTP binding the alpha subunit that will dissociate from the trimer and a beta gamma dimer will be dissociated. Now this activated alpha subunit that goes and it either activates or inhibits the effector which can be any enzyme or ion channel or carrier protein. On the basis of this alpha subunit, uh, the G proteins they can be classified into four categories that is GS, GI, G0 or GO and GQ. And all of these four categories have different functions. For example, GS proteins, they are responsible for the activation of adenyl cyclase. And also, they are responsible for calcium channel opening. Whereas, GI I is for inhibition. They inhibit adenyl cyclase and they are responsible for the opening of potassium channel. GO is for calcium channel inhibition and GQ that is responsible for the activation of phospholipase C. Now there are three major effector pathways of GPCRs. As we know adenyl cyclase activation is done by the GS proteins. So let us consider now these proteins are GS proteins and our agonist let us suppose it is adrenaline now when adrenaline will come and bind to these gpcrs what will happen the gdp will be replaced by gtp and there will be dissociation of this trimer now this activated alpha subunit it goes and affects the effector which is adenyl cyclase in this case. Now adenyl cyclase when it will be activated it will start converting ATP into cyclic AMP. That is why this pathway is also known as cyclic AMP pathway. Now cyclic AMP is our second messenger. It directly stimulates the calcium channels also and it functions through cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase A. Now protein kinase A when it is activated by cyclic AMP it alters the 
functions of certain enzymes ion channels and carrier proteins and thus it produces response like increased contractility or impulse generation uh, glycogenolysis lipolysis etc and opposite effects are observed in case of gi proteins which will cause cyclic uh, amp inhibition they will inhibit adenylyl cyclase this will inhibit adenylyl cyclase and there will be no formation of cyclic amp and all the functions which were to be produced they will be inhibited now let us discuss the next pathway which is phospholipase c or ip3 dag pathway which is carried out by gq proteins in this case the agonist will be histamine now what happens when histamine comes and binds to the gpcrs again this heterotrimeric unit it will be activated by gtp and these uh, gtp activated proteins they will dissociate the activated alpha subunit now it activates phospholipase c which is the effector in this case now phospholipase c it will start converting membrane phospholipids that is pip2 which is phosphatidyl inositol 4,5 bisphosphate it will convert pip2 to dag and ip3 ip3 is inositol 1,4,5 triphosphate and dag is diacyl glycerol now uh, dag it remains in the membrane and it activates uh, protein kinase c with the help of calcium and ip3 this is water soluble and being water soluble it diffuses to the cytosol and in in the cytoplasm it reaches the endoplasmic reticulum and it mobilizes calcium or it releases calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum and we know when the calcium level increases in the cell the contraction will be increased so this was the ip3 dag pathway now the third pathway in gpcrs is channel regulation in channel regulation what happens is when the uh, g proteins they get activated they can directly uh, open or inhibit the ionic channels for example the uh, calcium and the potassium channels they can directly uh, either they can open or inhibit these channels without the use of second messengers like cam or ip3 they do not use these second messengers they directly act on these ionic channels for example the gs proteins they uh, act on the calcium channels they open the calcium channels whereas uh, gi and go uh, proteins they open the potassium channels so they can bring about depolarization repolarization or hyperpolarization of the cell and the, these uh, opening and closing of the cell they can be uh, they are the function of beta gamma dimer because alpha dimer uh, unit was involved in the production of second messenger now this dissociated beta gamma dimer it goes directly to the ionic channel and either opens or inhibits this so this is the third pathway in case of gpcrs now the second type of transducer mechanism is ion channel receptors which are also known as ligand gated ion channels now as far as the structure is concerned it is pentameric in nature that means it will it will be having five subunits and they have two of the alpha subunits they have beta gamma and delta subunit and these two alpha subunits they have the agonist binding site on the extracellular site
Now these are the cell surface receptors and they enclose iron selective channel that means they are specific for a particular ion if these ion channels are for sodium ions they will only allow the passage of sodium ions through them so uh, every channel is specific for their specific ion for example sodium potassium chloride or calcium so they are specific for their specific ion now what happens is for example this is our ion channel and it is lying in the closed state now and when it binds with the agonist what happens agonist binding or ligand binding that will lead to the opening of this ion channel now this ion channel it opens and it allows the passage of the ion through them thus the opening and closing that only depends upon the binding of the ligand no involvement of uh, coupling proteins or second messengers therefore this transducer mechanism is the fastest mechanism for drug action which acts in milliseconds the third type of transducer mechanism is transmembrane enzyme linked receptors transmembrane because these receptors they pass through the whole of the uh, membrane enzyme linked because the cytosolic side is linked with an enzyme so let us discuss the structure first the extracellular part is the ligand binding site and they uh, they mostly bind with the peptide hormones such as uh, the insulin or the nerve growth factor or epidermal growth factor and this is the transmembrane helical peptide coiled therefore it is known as helical and the intracellular subunit it is having the enzymatic property and generally commonly it is having the protein kinase property that phosphorylates tyrosine residues now what happens is in the unliganded state they remain as a monomer the only single unit exists but what happens when there will be a hormone binding head for example insulin binding or nerve growth factor binding then what happens is hormone binding induces dimerization of the receptor molecules they will form a dimer and there will be conformational changes which will activate the protein kinase in this cytosolic site and there will be phosphorylation of these tyrosine residues now now the phosphorylation of these tyrosine residues they will increase the affinity of these enzymes for substrates especially for proteins which are having sh2 domain so what will happen this phosphorylation will activate these proteins and phosphorylation of these proteins will take place now they are phosphorylated and we know when proteins get phosphorylated they are activated and hence they will produce a response and that response in this case can be there will be activation of metabolic reactions there will be cell differentiation cell growth etc next type of transducer mechanism is jack stat binding receptors they look somewhat similar to the transmembrane enzyme linked receptors but the difference is they do not have the intrinsic kinase activity let us understand from the process itself so when there will be agonist binding similar to the previous one this agonist binding will induce dimerization and conformational changes and these conformational changes they will increase the affinity for cytosolic tyrosine protein kinase which are also known as 
jack molecules that is janus kinases molecules these are basically tyrosine protein kinase molecules when agonist binds now these cytosolic molecules jack molecules their affinity is increased and they go and bind to the receptor when they go and bind to the receptor now the phosphorylation of the receptor takes place the tyrosine residues they get phosphorylated after the activation of jack now phosphorylation of these tyrosine residues that will increase the binding of the stat molecules again stat molecules they are freely moving protein molecules in the cytosol which are known as signal transducer and activator of transcription they go and now they bind with this jack when they bind with this jack the tyrosine residues of the stat they also get phosphorylated after phosphorylation these stat molecules they get activated and a dimer is formed dimer of stat molecules is formed which now dissociates from the receptor when it dissociates from the receptor this dimer translocates to the nucleus it enters the nucleus there it can regulate the gene transcription and after the gene transcription it can regulate or it can produce a response there will be regulation of transcription gene transcription and there will be response now the fifth and the last type of transducer mechanism is receptor regulating gene expression these are also known as glucocorticoid receptors so the glucocorticoid receptor looks somewhat like this which is attached to the hsp90 which are the complex proteins known as the heat shock proteins so they are attached with the, these complex proteins and on the carboxy terminus they have a binding site and this is also known as the hinge region after this we have a dna binding site which is having two zinc fingers and then we have a amino terminus now let's discuss the process directly now glucocorticoids are lipid soluble chemical messengers so they can easily penetrate the cell and they bind to the cytoplasmic or the nuclear receptors these proteins which are bounded with these uh, heat shock proteins after the binding of glucocorticoid now these proteins they are dissociated after dissociation of these proteins now these receptors they can form a dimer that means a similar structure like this they join together and they form a dimer after forming a dimer they can go inside the nucleus or if they are already in the nucleus now they can bind to the dna when they bind to the dna Uh, when they bind to the dna uh, what happens is they bind to a specific region which are known as gre that is glucocorticoid responsive elements when they bind to this region now they can regulate transcription that means a particular mrna will be formed after formation of mrna it goes outside the nucleus and it uh, the translation occurs in the ribosomes and proteins will be formed these particular proteins they are responsible for the uh, alteration of the cells functions